So today we're going to be talking about the third nerve and third nerve palsy. So the number three nerve is in charge of the lid, and so we might get a ptosis, either a complete or a partial ptosis. It's in charge of the pupil, and the pupil might be dilated, or it might be normal, and it might be partially reactive, poorly reactive, or normally reactive, depending on how much pupil involvement we have. And because it's in charge of several muscles, the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, the superior rectus, the inferior oblique, your eye will be down and out. So it's going to be exotropic and hypotropic. So we're going to have an eye that is down and out. The lid will be down. The pupil will be dilated. However, you might not have every branch of the third involved. You might have only partial involvement. You might have just divisional involvement of just the superior division with the lid and the superior rectus. Mm -hmm. And so you can have partial or complete palsies. The third nerve, like all the cranial nerves, has its start in the brainstem, and in this case, in the midbrain. It travels as a fascicle after leaving its nucleus and exits the subarachnoid space. In this location, it is parallel to the posterior communicating artery, the PCOM. The posterior communicating artery communicates between the anterior and the posterior circulation. And an aneurysm that occurs in the posterior communicating artery can hit the number three nerve. And so the most dangerous thing in a new acute third nerve palsy with or without pupil involvement, with or without partial or complete ptosis, with or without partial or complete involvement of the muscles, the thing we're worried about is a PCOM aneurysm. So when we're confronted with a third nerve palsy, we need to make sure there's no other cranial nerve involved. That means testing the other nerves that live near three, number four, number five, number six. In order to test the integrity of four, which innervates the superior oblique muscle, we'd like the patient to look down and we're gonna see the torsion because the primary action of the superior oblique is in torsion. So every third that's complete, we wanna see if there's in torsion and down gaze because the fourth could be involved and that would place the lesion somewhere else, like the cavernous sinus or in the brainstem rather than just an isolated third. So once you've made sure it's an isolated number three palsy, we're gonna try and figure out what to do with this. Some people would say that if you have a complete palsy in a vasculopathic patient who has no pupil involvement, complete pupil sparing, that you could observe that. That's probably okay, but most people would image third nerve palsy regardless of the pupil involvement, regardless of the presence of pain, and regardless of the completeness of the palsy or the partial or complete nature of the ptosis. And so our first imaging study of is non-contrast CT scan to look for subarachnoid hemorrhage if we're worried about aneurysm. And in most places, a CTA is the imaging study that we're gonna do if we're gonna look for aneurysm. So you need an A, an angiogram of some kind, to find an A, the A we're looking for is aneurysm. Different types of angiograms, CTA, MRA, DSA, digital subtraction angiography. But because in the emergency room, it's faster to get a non-contrast CT followed by a contrast CTA of the head. This is usually our go-to imaging in the emergency room. So all the third nerve palsies need to have a CT, CTA if they're urgent or emergent or you're worried about subarachnoid hemorrhage and if you're worried about aneurysm. If the CT and the CTA are both negative, you still have to do an MRI. And the reason is, CTCTA is good for aneurysmal causes of third nerve palsy, but MRI is better for soft tissue and all the other causes of third nerve palsy that have nothing to do with aneurysm, like stroke and tumors and demyelinating disease and a whole host of other things that a CT scan is just not good enough. So normally I will just tack on the MRA onto the MRI because sometimes the CTA can miss thrombosed aneurysm or might not be able to see uh, as well as a MRA because of bone hardening artifact at the skull base or, or technical difficulties. So CT, CTA followed by MRI. MRA is our procedure of choice in that order for the evaluation for third nerve palsy and make sure it's not an aneurysm. If everything's negative, then we're gonna look for the usual suspects, 
Ischemia would be the number one cause in vasculopathic age patients. Giant cell arteritis has to be considered in every elderly patient who has new onset diplopia, even if it looks like a third nerve palsy. And then you could test for the infectious and e inflammatory etiologies. But the main point is making sure it's not an aneurysm. CT, CTA, followed by MRI, MRA is the preferred imaging for third nerve palsy.